I'm low key really booty tickled about what I just did to my phone. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah. I hate that booty tickle feeling. Yeah. I'm heartbroken. He dropped it. So, you guys could do me a favor. I'm going to start the NCCER class now. Um, yep. Can you guys go ahead and mute yourselves? Then I'll start talking about some of this, okay? And then I will be asking you guys some questions as we do this. And then you can just unmute yourselves to answer my questions and then re-mute mute yourselves after, okay? So this section that we are going to be covering today is the last module for the NCCER. Um, this module is called Material Handling. So give me one sec to log this in. I have a love-hate relationship with this module. I like it because it's um, pretty straightforward. It's, a, it's probably the shortest, and I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Like there's no tricks in this section, um, but I dislike it because kind of like on all of the tests when I um, give them to you, there are some deceiving questions kind of deceiving questions. Um, and the other thing is, I don't like it because I don't have a lot of the materials to like really show you or put you on top of so you can really get that experience. Like I don't have a forklift at Youth Build where you guys can practice driving or using those hand signals on. Um, I don't have like a motorized wheelbarrow or anything like that that you guys can practice with or use. So I'm frustrated because it would be nice to have those things available for us to use and kind of play with which makes this section um, a little bit more interesting. So, like I said, um, some of this content is gonna be pretty straightforward. It's really all about how to safely handle different types of construction materials. So that's everything from hazardous chemicals, things like uh, explosive gas cylinders, to how to properly stack bricks or lumber. So it's covering a pretty wide range of things. Um, but the test itself is only about 15 questions, and I have confidence that all of you will be able to pass the test. Usually, this module will take us probably three or four days, but there's, there's some um, interactive stuff that we have to do in person. So this week, I'm just going to give the PowerPoint lecture and talk about some slides. And then next week, I'm going to ask that you guys meet me at Youth Build on Friday. And what we will do is recover the, the hands-on portion of this module, and then we will take the test, okay? We'll do a quick review, and then we'll take the test. And that'll be next Friday, okay? So please plan your schedules for that so that you can attend that on Friday, okay? So starting, we got, is this gonna let me click forward? Okay, so there's a bunch, there's some, there's quite a bit in this PowerPoint that I'm straight up just going to skip because it's not very pertinent to kind of what I want to focus on that you guys really need to know. There's a lot of fluff in here um, and like this is demonstrating some not techniques and we're going to be doing that in person. So part of this module is also learning how to tie some knots and so it's kind of a waste of time for me to sit here with my own string, show you how to tie the knot here when you can't practice it on your own. So that's kind of silly in my opinion. So we're gonna skip that section. <sighs> so a big section of this, this kind of relates to that first module we did. Does anybody remember what the first module on NCCER was? Can somebody unmute themselves and tell me? Was it about like safety it's about guidelines? personal protection equipment. <clears throat> it was all about safety. So the reason these two modules are connected is because this is all about how to safely handle these materials. Okay. So the first thing is when you are going to lift an object that is heavy. So remember, if you're on a construction site, you're surrounded by heavy and dangerous objects. And so how are you going to lift those things? So if I have a, a bag of concrete, you know, most bags of concrete, they come in either 60-pound bags or 80-pound bags. 
and you might have 50 or 60 bags to lift into the back of a truck, okay? If you are lifting with your back, all those bags, all day, you are gonna go home, be in a ton of pain, and not be able to get up the next day. So knowing proper lifting techniques, I know all of you have heard this, but you gotta lift with your back, but that is key if you wanna be successful in the construction industry and actually have a career. Because remember, this is a career we're talking about. If you want to be able to do this for 20, 30 years, you've got to be safe the whole time. And it's best if you start out safe when you're younger so you don't damage your body and you can't do the work while you're um, older. And then you want to retire someday too, right? So you don't want to be retired and constantly be in pain. Hey, Evan, could you do me a favor and mute yourself? I'm getting some feedback from you. Thank you, sir. So, as you guys know, um, when you're gonna lift something, you wanna wear the proper PPE. So one of the PPEs that you may have on a construction site would be a back brace, right? Um, you've seen them in the gym, probably, where they just wrap around your back and it helps support your back, helps keep your back straight. Um, you probably also want to uh, wear gloves, depending on the material that you're trying to lift. Um, and the number one thing you want to do first, and this is something that you might want to write down, and if I ask you to write something down, it means it might be on the test. Um, the very first thing you want to do before attempting a lift is to assess the object you're lifting to make sure there's nothing like poking out of it that when you grab, it could stab into you, or if there's any sharp edges that you're trying to grab onto, you don't want to grab onto that. Maybe there's a tear, so if you were to lift it, it's going to spill everything all out. You want to assess what you're lifting first before attempting to lift it, okay? And then when you do lift it, you're not going to bend down over it, right? You're going to bend at your knees, come down with your back straight, put your arms around the object, and use your legs to lift the object up. You're never going to pull with your back. You're going to lift directly up. It's all your legs, and you're just holding your back straight and steady, okay? Um, this is something that we will practice next Friday. I know it seems kind of silly to practice, but it's key. And this is how you're going to be working those long days on a construction site or decades, honestly. So size up the load first. That is what I'm talking about when you're checking it out and making sure that you're going to be able to safely lift the object. Um, and when you lift the object, you lower in the same way. So your back straight lift with your legs, you're also gonna set it down with your legs, keeping your back straight as well, okay? Um, really, you're just holding your arms steady, you're holding them still, you're not using your arms to lift something up. Travis, I see you have a hand raised. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I was just gonna say that like, uh, what you were saying, like not leaning over it. You know, I was really, really little and uh, I watched my dad do that and he was shoveling snow and he leaned over the shovel and didn't lift with his knees and pop his back out. And I learned that shit from a very young age. Sorry, my language. I learned that <laughs> stuff from a very young age. To squat with your knees when you're lifting that kind of material, any kind of material, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, he popped his back out shoveling snow. So like, it, it, depend, it really depends on like, you know, using your knees. Yep. Uh, not your knees, but more your legs. Because yeah. think about how large your leg muscles are compared to the muscles that you have in your back or your arm. Your leg yeah. muscles are always going to be larger and stronger. And remember, yeah. you guys only have one back. Okay. When you mess up your back, it's messed up for life. And honestly, I would like to be able to pick up my kids someday, my grandkids someday, without yeah. being in terrible pain. Um, so thank you, Travis. That's a great point to make. <laughs> Oh, man, Alex, speaking of kids, dude, try going to, like, lifting that sheetrock that one day to the ceiling at the Boone house and coming home to pick up my son afterwards. Holy shit. Exactly. It's not fun. And you guys, oh, only, did one, you, you guys only did, like, one sheet of sheetrock that you put on the ceiling, right? We didn't even put it up. We just had to hold it up for, like, seven minutes while fucking Tom yeah. tried to figure out where the measurements <laughs> of it were wrong. <laughs> So we so put it back down. We got it up, it up, and I was like, "Fuck this!" So think about it, guys. Imagine if you were doing a whole ceiling in a house. How tired are you going to be if you're 
And how sore are you going to be if you're not lifting that thing up safely and properly? I'm not doing sheetrock. Yeah, because it, it hurts, right? And you already have a bad knee, Danny, so you don't want to mess up the rest of your body. Yeah. Yes, Evan? When we were lifting that drywall, I messed my thumb up. Let's see, it's really easy to mess yourself up on a construction site, huh? Like my thumb, I can't really move it at all. Like it's still sore from lifting that drywall. Oh my god, guys, stop complaining. <laughs> if it's if That's it's safe for Evan, you may want to go see a doctor. I sprained my back nine times last year, and I almost made it ten this year. Yeah, so that here, drywall, the the drywall wasn't shit. That carpet and those motherfucking wood panels for the <laughs> floor dude those things Ooh, weigh about lion. 75 pounds of uh, a piece and i had to carry like two or three of those a time those things were fucking heavy so guys i used to work at a hardware store and i mean it when i say like those bags of concrete 80 pound bags and we would have oh guys gosh. come with their trucks and ask and buy like 100 bags of that concrete and guess who has to load it? We do. And if I, I would have a terrible back right now if I was lifting that stuff with my back rather than my going up and down with shingles. Yeah, exactly. Shingles are super heavy too. It's yeah. a pain. I mean, I know we're all cursing on this, but it's a pain in the ass, man. Yeah, yeah. Back. Um, so take care of yourself now. And that's why this stuff is really important to actually know and understand. Because a lot of people say, Hey, yeah, I have to lift, lift with my legs, but they don't actually know what that means. Um, so that's why we're going to practice it next Friday. So when you have an object up, okay, any area where that object might fall, like if I lose my balance, is going to be treated as a fall zone, okay? So you want to keep, like I'm not going to lift this object and let my dog walk underneath me or, or my child walk underneath me. Because that's a hazard, right? That's unsafe. Because if I lose my balance, if maybe it just suddenly gets too heavy for me to carry, I'm going to drop it and it's going to fall in that fall zone. So that whole zone is considered a hazard. So you want to keep that clear as you're walking or as you're carrying it to the place that it needs to go. Um, that goes for forklifts as well, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Think about how high those forklifts can raise um, a pallet of brick, right? Think about how heavy that is. And so any place where that object might be able to fall is going to be treated as the fall zone. Um, and that's something that you might want to write down as well. <sighs> so different types of materials have different requirements for how they are stacked and stored. So most of you have been in a hardware store. And so how do they stack their lumber, like their two by fours? How is their two by four is typically stacked. Let me have a volunteer. Shit, I got it. Okay. I usually go by length. Yep, length, and how are they stacked together? Are they just anywhere? No. Nope, how are they stacked? They usually stack them like, uh, usually length is first, but they'll do by thickness, but they'll stack them in even, or even rows of wood. Even rows, exactly. So the reason we want to stack lumber in even rows is one, because that's the neatest way to stack. And when we're on a construction site, we want things to be neat because when they're messy, they're a hazard, they're a safety hazard. If I'm throwing, say, a bunch of two by fours, uh, maybe a two by four by 12, just in a pile, and they're kind of like all stacked, twisted and around, well, again, that's a safety hazard. Somebody can trip over that if they're trying to get those out. And two, you're going to damage your lumber as well. Because what does lumber do when, it do when it's not supported the whole way? It bows, and then it's going to start bending and twisting. If it rained, it's going to be even worse. And that's money that you're wasting if it's not stacked properly. The same thing goes for pipes. So if your pipes are just stacked all cluttered, like, you know, pick up sticks, if you guys played that game when you were a kid, if they're stacked like that, they're just going to get damaged, and it's a major safety hazard. So you want them stacked in nice, even, neat rows. Um, so if you're working on a construction site in the future and you see that something is stacked improperly, you should let your manager know or just take initiative and stack it properly yourself because you're going to save um, people time, energy, efforts. You're going to make the job site safer. And it's just going to be best all around. <coughs> so bricks, 
you might have seen on a uh, in a home hardware store too. Typically, they are stacked. Um, so if one stacks here, the the row on top is going to be alternated, and so it's going to be on top of like halfway on each brick. It's going to be on the seam, and that's so that each brick is actually supporting the load. And so when you stack that up, okay, when you stack bricks, typically you don't want to go over four feet. So write that down if you have paper and a pen in front of you. When you're stacking bricks, you don't typically want to go over four feet because you have to stack starting differently after you get to that four feet part. When you get to that four feet high, you have to come in, I think it's two inches, and then you have to restart your stack and it has to be kind of like a staggered type pattern, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, the same thing goes for bags. So like those concrete bags I mentioned, you want those to be staggered as you're stacking as well. And you don't want them to come up much past four feet as well. Okay, let's see what we got next. Yep, so here's the pattern I was talking about. So you can see that first section um, goes up four feet. And then once you reach that four foot mark, you have to come in two inches and then you can stack um, a little bit higher. But most places, they're just not gonna stack above four feet because it just makes it too complicated and they just leave it at that. Um, so that four foot number is gonna be important for you guys to know. So write it down if you have something in front of you. Uh, the same kind of thing for bricks, there's a slightly different rule for bricks. Um, depending on the size of the brick, it looks like you can go up to six feet, um, but that's, that's still pretty dangerous. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're ever doing some maybe uh, architecture work or agricultural work or something like that where you're buying a whole pallet of bricks at a time okay um, so some of you wore a safety harness during that first module you guys saw the safety harness um, so you kind of know what it is um, remember just to make sure you're using it um, in cases that it would keep you safe um, yeah, I'll talk about this more next Friday because this will come up a little bit more when we actually do the knot tying and the rope stuff. Oh, here's something super important, okay? And write this down as well. That bottom bullet where it says, never stack or store materials on scaffolds, okay? So what are scaffolds? Does anybody know? Anybody remember? The uh, weird... Uh, shoot, it's hard to explain. I can't. Never mind. Never mind. I can do it. Uh, you want to try? You want to try, Sage? They're like these. It's like this metal pipe. Yeah, you're right. Structure, and it's just to stand on. It's not to hold anything. Exactly. So you're right. It is a metal structure that kind of gives us elevation. So say you're painting a house, maybe the house is a couple stories tall. It's gonna. It's a metal structure that we can put together to get us higher, so that we can paint at those higher spots. Just an example. Uh, we use scaffolds for all types of construction, though. So uh, yes, they are for people, not product. Okay, people, not product. So you don't want to store anything on scaffolds that goes not even tools usually you don't even want to set your tool down because that is a safety hazard because it could get kicked off it could fall off and it could hit somebody scaffolds are also not the most stable things to be on they're stable for people for like the short term right they're not going to be long-term storage in any sense of the way whatsoever okay so remember that do not stack or store materials on scaffolds uh, here's the knot section. We're going to skip this. Um, you guys will be tying these knots um, on next Friday, okay? And I'll go over how to tie all of them, so it's, it's kind of fun. I will say this knot right here, the clove hitch, this is one knot that you will need to know its name for the test, okay? The clove hitch, okay? And I like to remember it because you see in step four there, it ends up looking kind of like a box, okay? So you need to know the name of that knot. Okay, I'm gonna move on. We're gonna practice tying all those knots. Okay, 
So as you guys know, and I think you guys, I think half of you got to see when we visited the labors earlier, early on in your term back in January, that uh, we use gas cylinders pretty often, especially for things like welding. So they are incredibly dangerous. They can have, um, let me think. So per square inch, that means a square inch of the surface, you can have 90, 150, 200 pounds of pressure per square inch. So think about how small an inch is, right? That's pretty tiny. An inch, think of a square inch, and that has 90 to 200 pounds of pressure on that one little area for every single square inch. So they are under huge amounts of pressure. So you gotta treat them safely, right? Because if it gets damaged, if it gets hit, it can shoot literally some of these when they have like the valve broken, they shoot off like missiles and they can go miles. They're under such pressure. So you gotta be super safe around them. So you're not gonna be transporting them with just anything. They have oh, very- yeah. Those, what? I seen those get transported. Those things are heavy as fuck. Remember the day that uh, we all went to the laborers and they showed us uh, how yeah. they were transporting yeah. them inside? Yeah, yeah. They were telling us how heavy they were. There was like, it took yeah. like four dudes to, uh, to bring one of those inside. Yeah, and they started rolling them. Yeah. Yeah. Right on the edge. They are incredibly heavy. You're right. You don't want one person to be <laughs> dealing with this. One, yes, because it's heavy, and two, because you want somebody else there um, to help you because it's unsafe if you're trying, even if you're strong enough to handle it yourself, you still want another person because yeah. having another person with you is going to make it a lot safer. I so live you can both handle that load. You got to be fucking Superman to do that <laughs> shit by yourself. And, well, there's, there's special ways that you can move them yourself, um, but you guys don't need to know that. I worked in a lab for a while and so I was dealing with these cylinders pretty constantly and there are ways that you can move them safely on your own um, you just don't want to do it over long distances so but yes they're incredibly dangerous I mean they're filled with gases that are extremely toxic or explosive um, so treat them kindly I mean it'd be a cool way to go out I guess shit I mean go up in a ball of flame sure but go up with a bang I know I wouldn't want to do it. So as, so as I was saying, guys, you're not going to use just anything to move these things. I'm not going to throw one of these cylinders in a wheelbarrow and move it across the construction site. They have special carts called cylinder carts. <coughs> I know that name comes as a shock. A cylinder cart carries cil cylinder tubes, cylinder gas tubes. Um, but you're going to use a cylinder cart to transport these, okay? And that might be on your test as well, so you might want to write that down. No, this is off topic, but Go ahead. but if you like burn to death, they say that's one of the most painful ways to die. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't sound fun to me. <clears throat> okay. I'm crazy. I feel I like it'd be fun. Ha! No, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Yep. So yeah, just make sure to use the appropriate cart, a cylinder cart, to move these type of objects, okay? Uh, same thing for um, like oil drums um, or lubrication drums. So if you're using, let's say, I don't know, some super large hydraulic press, for example, um, you're going to have drums of hydraulic fluid sometimes, and they're... Again, they're even heavier than those cylinders usually. So you're gonna to wanna to use the correct um, tools to transport them and move them around to make sure it's safe. Cause you don't want that to fall on anybody's foot. You also don't want it to fall, crack open and spread um, whatever it contains all over the place, okay? So there are, remember, kind of what we've talked about on the job site when we were doing the hand tools and power tools tests, using the right tool for the job is what you wanna do. And so these things all have specific tools that are the correct things to use when you're dealing with them, okay? Um, same thing for moving pipes. So pipes can cause a pretty big hazard. Um, they're really long, you can 
poke somebody with them. You can move and hit somebody with them. Um, so just be extra careful with those. Um, when you're dealing with, say, um, like main water lines, talking about pipes, pretty big around, super heavy. They could be 20, 20 feet long. Um, it's going to be hard to navigate that with two people carrying it because you're going to be focused on actually supporting its weight. If you have one person on each end. That's why they have tools like this, which is a V cart that you see in the picture, where you lay those tubes down and then all you're doing is navigating the cart. So you're not spending your energy lifting the, the tubes, you're spending your energy transporting the tubes and making sure you don't hit anybody or damage anything or damage the tube itself. Okay, um, and what it says there in that bottom bullet, um, when you are lifting this, when you are transporting these objects with a V cart, for example, you're going to want somebody acting specifically as a spotter. So their hands aren't on the cart. All they're doing is they're standing maybe towards the front. They're spotting, making sure to help navigate those uh, that cart through so it doesn't hurt anybody or damage the tubes. Because if you damage your tubes, you're making less money. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is just another type of cart that you can use for uh, transporting pipes. It's yeah, it's essentially the same thing. It's just for slightly larger. Okay. Okay, so here's a key point. What we're gonna talk about next is um, a motorized, like a wheelbarrow, for example. And for these next few objects, you need to know, um, so write this down, that you must be properly trained, certified, and authorized in order to use these objects, okay? You need all three of those things, okay? Um, you also need to know how heavy the object is that you're loading um, because you don't wanna exceed the weight capacity of that object. Um, so let me, let's start talking about the first one. Uh, here is a powered wheelbarrow. Pretty straightforward, right? It's basically a wheelbarrow with a motor on it. So you're not putting your own energy through, you're just driving it basically. It also has, a uh, a um, hydraulic like lift so it also dumps the load for you too. Whenever you use an object like this you want to inspect it first make sure there's uh, nothing wrong with it nothing's damaged you're going to look at the wheels make sure that there's uh, all the wheels are properly inflated make sure your um, gasoline lines aren't leaking make sure you can turn it on turn it off make sure the, the handbrake is working so that it's actually clasping the uh, the wheels to make sure that you can stop if you start to lose control because if you can carry things you know we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of pounds probably close to a um, thousand or even two thousand pounds depending on what you're carrying so you want to make sure that this, this is working really well because you don't want to lose control of that object um, you also always want to double check the weight capacity for each of these <coughs> Because different models will have different weight capacities. And you don't want to overload that weight capacity because you're just causing a safety hazard for yourself and everybody around you if you overload that object. Because it's more likely to tip over. Um, especially when you're going on, you, you're usually using this type of thing when you're going like on inclines or downclines. Um, when you're going up or down hills because it takes a lot of manpower to do that. So you want an engine backing you up, typically for that. Okay. Uh, so Danny asked how fast these goes. Usually not too fast. Usually not too fast. Like a couple miles an hour is all you're looking at. Uh, but they, they have strength behind them. They're not meant for speed. They're meant to, they're meant for power. And so, so they're like pretty much you like they're just pretty much there to help you get up that incline and not to like take you up the incline yeah and to and it's really to save your body so if you work for a place that actually invests in these things they're not going to typically let you use them for any old job they're still going to have hand-powered wheelbarrows but they're going to let you use these when you have to take them either longer distances or if you have like an uphill or downhill that you need to get to, because they are just a lot safer. Because think about the wheelbarrows that you guys have used in the pack. How easy is it to go on a on a downcline? Like go down a hill with those? Oh, no. 
it's not very safe at all. So this is, it really helps you with those. That's so say it, it can uh, fire wood down a hill once. Like it was yeah. a two, -wheel, it was a two wheeled wheelbarrow where it had two on the front. Mm -hmm. And I went down the hill and it started getting out of control and I hit one little dip and it tipped sideways and I was rolling with firewood. Yep, it's a lot easier to lose control that way. Um, so take a look at the size of the engine on this. That's the thing with the red in the back of the wheelbarrow. And then compare it to what you have on this next one. Okay, so there's a pretty significant size difference there too, huh? So on that, th this is essentially, it essentially works the same way, um, but this is gonna carry heavier objects. And if you look at the back of this one, you also stand on this. Uh, whereas with the motorized wheelbarrow, you're walking behind it. So this is to carry just much heavier materials. Um, you're talking about concrete, sand, um, you're taking concrete to an area. Usually if you have like a concrete truck, so with like the big uh, cylindrical football on the back of it, um, they're also gonna have these available because that big truck may not be able to get everywhere that it needs to go to, to deliver concrete. And if that's the case, they're going to have a couple of these on the job site to maybe get it through like a, a small alley to get the concrete through a small alley to where it needs to go. Um, that's typically what you're going to see these used for. Okay, uh, and then we got a forklift. So there's a bunch of different types of forklifts. Um, obviously, they can be very dangerous. So what do you see on the back of this forklift? You see those cylinders, right? So what does that lead you to think? propane powered or something like that something like that right so you have an additional hazard back there right um yeah so a lot of these are also hydraulically powered so these can lift materials really high but they will also have weight capacities to them there are all kinds of different forklift sizes um really there's no one type of forklift at all they all lift vastly different weights. Um, so you gotta know what the weight capacity of the forklift you're on is, because if you try to lift something over its weight capacity, that could cause some extreme danger for you. There are some forklifts, which are very tiny, that might only lift a small pallet of material. There are some forklifts um, that are larger than like the youth build building, okay? So they come, like I said, all different uh, shapes and sizes. Um, definitely want you want to be inspecting these things daily because if you're going to be behind that wheel you want to make sure everything is working at a hundred percent because if something falls it's going to fall straight down and, and it's going to impact you um, and it's going to hurt you typically first um, when you're navigating the, these uh, forklifts you're usually going to also have a spotter with you so you're going to have one person on the inside driving the forklift and you're going to have one person kind of walking beside it, but further away, helping to navigate to identify potential hazards that maybe the person behind the wheel can't see because it can be kind of difficult to see it for this because even look at this one. What is right in front of that uh, driver's view? The lift, right? They, they don't have a huge field of view, so they need an additional person to help navigate. Um, so remember when I was talking about the fall area? So the fall area, the fall zone, is gonna be any area that um, a material can fall. So a fall area for a forklift is gonna be way larger than the fall area for maybe what I'm, something that I'm holding in my hands. Because those forks can lift something, you're talking 30 feet in the air, 40 feet in the air, depending on what forklift it is. And so anywhere that can, fall is going to be your fall zone so you want to stay away from that area even the person spotting is going to be away from that area as much as they can okay i think that's everything on that forklift <coughs> okay so here's a larger forklift um you can maybe notice a pretty big difference right away this one is larger for one um and the wheels are a little bit not a little bit, they're a lot bigger because this is meant to be used on uneven terrain, rough terrain, um, gravel, dirt, 
and just to get the material um, where it needs to go on maybe construction sites, for example, or lumber yards. So thinking about the physics of being behind a wheel on a forklift, okay, what do you think is better for travel? If you're carrying, say, say you're driving this thing, okay, the forklift in the picture, what do you think makes more sense to transport an object? When you have it up high, like where his forks are now, or to have it much lower, okay? Think about the physics behind that. What Probably much lower so that way it doesn't tip and fall. Okay, do you agree with that, Billy? Yeah. Yeah, you guys are exactly right. You wanna have whatever you're carrying lower for transport. Because when you're higher, what happens is you have a higher center of gravity and any little bump and it will just you might tip have in over. the road. What was that, Billy? It will just tip over. Exactly. So if you have the forks lift higher, you have a higher center of gravity. So any bump Especially if you have something you heavy on over. there. So you want to have that those forks and whatever you're carrying as low as you can to transport it. Okay? So good job. Um, so yeah, I would write that down. You want the whatever you're transporting as low as possible for a forklift. Um, so these are a bunch of hand signs, and we're going to practice some of these hand signs next Friday. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Um, this is these are the signals that the spotter uses that's walking beside the forklift. Okay, this is the best way to communicate rather than them than them trying to yell at each other. Yo. So they hear each other or not hear each other so keep that in mind um take a look those last two that you see which are dog everything and stop there's a key difference between those and they have that difference because dog everything which means to pause it means that the person behind the forklift is just going to pause and wait for further direction from the spotter so that's the most important one for you guys know and that's different than just having the person in the forklift stop. Okay, they're pausing, waiting for their directions versus just stopping right away. Okay, and we're almost done, guys. I promise. Hey, Alex. What's up? Can't you use those? Uh, like, aren't not? I don't. I don't recognize some of them, but like, right when I saw that, uh, I thought of like driving my four wheeler back in Idaho, like because I didn't have blinkers and shit, so like... Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's different set yeah, hand signals for that, that. but um, it's essentially the same thing. It's to communicate with somebody that you can't verbally hear, right? You're using those hand signals on your four-wheeler because you yeah. can't verbally communicate what your intentions are on that four-wheeler to the drivers around you. Yeah. But it's the exact same thing, exact same purpose. Okay. Let me skip ahead a little bit, guys, to see if there's anything else I really want to make sure we cover, and I don't think so. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to cover. All right, I'm sorry I went a little bit quicker than I wanted to, um, but I am recording this, so this will be on the YouTube page that Lily made probably this weekend. So remember, next week, the key for you guys is we will be doing some of this stuff in person. We're going to practice some of those hand signals. We're going to practice some lifting technique, and we're going to do that knot tying section. That will be in person next Friday for NCCER. And that's when we're also going to take the test. Okay. And then most, a, a couple of you will be finished with the NCCER. And so in future weeks, what's gonna happen is we will still have assigned times for NCCER, and that'll be time for you guys to catch up on modules that you missed, okay? Now, the only two that we'll have finished by then are Billy and Allie, okay? Those are the only two that will have finished every module on next Friday, as long as they make it to Friday, which I'm sure they will. And so what I'm gonna ask them to do if they are willing, and they can tell me no, if that's, if that's, a, that's up to them, they can tell me later. Um, I'm going to ask them to help me catch everybody up because they've passed everything. I would like their assistance in catching I everybody up. I can give you some pointers. Thing. I don't remember all the modules, but I know yep. I remember seven and eight, a little bit of six, five. Yo, I have a question though. What's up, Travis? 
Um, on Odyssey, like when I be doing that science, uh, it'd be asking me to do a project, and I'm like, I, what you mean a project? Let me answer that after we're done with uh, NCCR stuff, okay, Travis? Okay. Um. So yeah, Billy, I'll be there too. Um. So if you have any questions that you might need help, like reminders of, I'll be there to help you, and then you can help other people. Um. But I could use the assistance from you two if you're willing. I'm also going to have Cameron Baker, which you guys know from Steve's crew. He's also going to be helping out a little bit. And so I, th there's just quite a bit that uh, people need to catch up on. And so I'm not going to be able to do it all on my own is essentially what it comes down to because there's just too much. And I, I want all of you guys to get that cert soon. So I need to submit all of you at the same time. So I would hate to have Billy and Allie wait a few weeks for me to submit their certification. Um, but it looks like that's probably what we're going to have to do until I can catch everybody else up, okay? So expect that for the future weeks. And remember, we are going to be uh, in person next Friday for NCCER, okay? So let me stop sharing my screen.